Six of Crows, Chapter 2, Inej. Casbrecker didn't need a reason. Those were the words whispered on the streets of Ketterdam, in the taverns and coffee houses, in the dark and bleeding alleys of the pleasure district known as the Barrel. The boy they called Dirty Hands didn't need a reason any more than he needed permission to break a leg, sever an alliance, or to change a man's fortunes with the turn of a card. Of course they were wrong, Inej considered as she crossed the bridge over the black waters of the Bjorskenal to the deserted main square that fronted the exchange. Every act of violence was deliberate and every favor came with enough strings attached to stage a puppet show. Kaz always had his reasons. Inesh could just never be sure they were good ones, especially tonight. Inesh checked her knives, silently reciting their names as she always did when she thought there might be trouble. It was a practical habit, but a comfort too. The blades were her companions. She liked knowing they were ready for whatever the night might bring. She and Kaz saw the others gather near her on the great stone arch that marked the eastern entrance to the exchange. Three words had been carved into the rock above them. Eginant, Vorhand, Almant, Industry, Integrity, Prosperity. She kept close to the shuttered storefronts and lined the square, avoiding the pockets of flickering gaslight cast by the street lamps. As she moved, she inventoried the crew Cass had brought with him. Derex, Roddy, Muslin, and Keeg, Annika and Pim, and the chosen seconds for tonight's Barley, Jesper and Big Bolliger. They jostled and bumped one another, laughing, stamping their feet against the cold snap that had surprised the city this week, the last gasp of winter before spring began in earnest. They were all bruisers and brawlers, culled from the younger members of the dregs, the people Cass trusted most. Inej noted the glint of knives tucked into her belts, lead pipes, weighted chains, and axe handles studded with rusty nails, and here and there, the oily gleam of a gun barrel. She slipped silently into their ranks, scanning the shadows near the exchange for signs of black tip spies. Three ships, Jesper was saying. The shoe sent them. They were just sitting in First Harbor, cannons out, red flags flying, stuffed to the sails with gold. Big Bolger gave a low whistle. Would have liked to see that. Would have liked to steal that, replied Jesper. Half the merchant council was down there flapping and squawking, trying to figure out what to do. Don't they just want the shoe playing their debts? Big Walger asked. Cass shook his head, dark of hair glinting in the lamplight. He was a collection of hard lines and tailored edges, sharp jaw, lean build, wool coat, and snug across his shoulders. Yes and no, he said in his rock salt rasp. It's always good to have a country in debt to you. Makes for friendlier negotiations. Maybe the shoe are done with being friendly, said Jesper. They didn't have to send all the treasure at once. You think they stuck that trade ambassador? Cass's eyes found an edge unerringly in the crowd. Ketterdam had been buzzing about the assassination of the ambassador for weeks. It had nearly destroyed kirch zemni relations and sent the merchant council into an uproar. The Zemni blamed the Kirch. The Kirch suspected the shoe. Cass didn't care who was responsible. The murder fascinated him because he couldn't figure out how it had been accomplished. In one of the biz busiest corridors of the stat hall, in full view of more than a dozen government officials, the Zemni trade ambassador had stepped into a washroom. No one else had entered or left, but when his aide knocked on the door a few minutes later, there had been no answer. They'd broken down the door, they'd found the ambassador face down in white tiles, a knife in his back, the sink still running. Kaz had sent an edge to investigate the premises for hours. The washroom had no other entrance, no windows or vents, and even an edge ha hadn't mastered the art of squeezing herself through the plumbing. Yet the Zemni ambassador was dead. Cass hated a puzzle he couldn't solve, and he and Inej had concocted a hundred theories and to account for the murder, none of which satisfied, but they had more pressing problems tonight. She saw him signal to Jesper and Big Bolliger to divest themselves of weapons. Street law dictated that for the parley of this kind, each lieutenant be seconded by two of his foot soldiers and that they all be unarmed. Parley. The word felt like a deception, strangely prim and antique. No matter what the street law decreed, the night smelled like violence. Go on, give those guns over, Derek said to Jesper. With a great sigh, Jesper removed the gun belts at his hips. He had to admit he looked less uh, less himself without it. them. The Zemini sharpshooter was long-limbed, brown-skinned, constantly in motion. He pressed his lips to the pearl handles of his prized revolvers, bestowing each with a mournful kiss. Take good care of my babies, Jesper said, and handed them over to the Derek's. Uh, if, I see a single, if I see a single scratch or nick on those, I'll spell forgive me on your chest with bullet holes. You wouldn't waste the ammo. I need to be dead halfway through forgive, Big Bolliger said as he dropped a, a hatchet, a switchblade, and his preferred weapon, a thick chain weighted with a heavy padlock, onto Roddy's expectant hands. Jesper rolled the, his eyes. It's about sending a message. What's the point of a dead guy with a fork written on his chest? Compromise, Kaz said. I'm sorry, does the trick, and uses fewer bullets. Derek laughed, but Inej noted that he cradled Jesper's revolvers very gently. What about that? Jesper asked, gesturing to Kaz's walking stick. Kaz's laugh was low and humorless. Who deny a poor cripple his cane? If the cripple is you, then m any man with his sense. Then it's a good thing we're meeting Giles. Kaz drew a watch from his vest pocket. It's almost midnight. Inej turned her gaze to the exchange. It was a little more than a large rectangular courtyard surrounded by warehouses and shipping offices. But during the day, it was the heart of Ketterdam, bustling with wealthy merchants and buying and selling shares in the trade voyages that passed through the city's ports. Now it was nearly twelve bells and the exchange was deserted, but for the guards who patrolled the perimeter and the rooftop. 
The exchange was one of the few remaining parts of the city that hadn't been divvied up and claimed in the ceaseless skirmishes between the Ketterdam's rival gangs. It was supposed to be neutral territory, but it didn't feel neutral to Inej. It felt like a hush of woods before a snare yanks tight and the rabbit starts to scream. It felt like a trap. This is a mistake, she said. Big Bolliger startled. He hadn't known she was standing there. Inej heard the name of the drags preferred for her whispered among their ranks. The Wraith. Gills was up to something. Of course he is, said Cass. His voice had the rough, abraded texture of the stone against stone. Inej always wondered if he'd sound that way as a little boy, if he'd ever been a little boy. Then why come here tonight? Because this is the way Per Haskell wants it. Old man, old ways, Inej thought, but didn't say, and suspected the other dregs were thinking the same thing. He's going to get us all killed, she said. Jesper stretched his long arms overhead and grinned, his teeth white against his dark skin. He had yet to give up his rifle, and the silhouette of it across the slack made him resemble a gawky, long-limbed bird. Statistically, he'll probably get only get some of us killed. It's not something to joke about, she replied. The look Cass cast her was amused. She knew how she sounded, stern, fussy, like an old crone making dire pronouncements from her porch. She didn't like it, but she also knew she was right. Besides, old women must know something, or they wouldn't live to gather wrinkles and yell from their front stoops. Jesper wasn't making a joke in Edge, said Kaz. He's figuring the odds. Big Bolliger cracked his huge knuckles. Well, I've got lager and a skillet of eggs waiting for me at the Cooper room, so I can't be the one to die tonight. Care to place a wager? Jasper asked. I'm not going to bet on my own death. Kaz flipped his hat onto his head and ran his gloved fingers along the brim in a quick salute. Why not, Bolger? We do it every day. He was right. Inej's debt to Per Haskell meant she gambled her life every time she took a new job or assignment, every time she left her room at the flat. Tonight was no different. Kaz struck his walking, walking stick against the cobblestone as the bells from the church of Barter began to chime. The group fell silent. The time for talk was done. Gilles isn't smart, but he's just bright enough to be trouble, said Kaz. No matter what you hear, you don't join the fray unless I give this command. Stay sharp. Then he gave Inej a brief nod. And stay hidden. No mourners, Jesper said as he tossed his rifle to Roddy. No funerals. The rest of the dregs murmured in reply. Among them, it passed for good luck. Before Inej could melt into the shadows, Kaz tapped her arm with his crow's head cane. Keep a watch on the rooftop guards. Gills may have them in his pocket. Then Inej began, but Kaz was already gone. Inej threw up her hands in frustration. She had a hundred questions, but as usual, Kaz was keeping a strangle hold on the answers. She jogged toward the canal, facing the wall of the exchange. Only the lieutenants and their seconds were allowed to enter during the party. But just in case the black tips got any ideas, the other dregs would be waiting right outside the eastern arc with weapons at the ready. She knew Gills would have his crew of heavily armed black tips gathered at the western entrance. Inej would find her way in. The rules of fair playing among the gangs were from her Haskell's time. Besides, she was a wraith. The only law that applied to her was gravity, and some days she defied that too. The lower level of the exchange was dedicated to windows warehouses, so Inej located the drain pipe to shinny up. Something made her hesitate before she wrapped her hand around it. She drew a bone light from her pocket and gave it a shake, casting a pale green glow over the pipe. It was slick with oil. She followed the wall, seeking another option, and found a stone cornice bearing a statue of Kirch's three flying fishes within reach. She stood on her toes and tentatively felt the along the top of the cornice. It had been covered in ground glass. I am expected, she thought with grim pleasure. She joined up with the dregs less than two years ago, just days after her 15th birthday. It had been a matter of survival, but it gratified her to know that in such short time she'd become someone to take precautions against. Though, if the black tips thought the tricks like this would keep the wraith from her goal, they were sadly mistaken. She drew two climbing spikes from the pockets of her quilted vest and wedged first one, then the other between the bricks of the wall as she hoisted herself higher, her questing feet finding the small holds and ridges in the stone. As a child learning the high wire, she'd gone barefoot, but the streets of Ketterdam were too cold and wet for that. After a few bad spills, she'd paid the Agrisha fabricator working in secret out of a gin shop at the Winch Strat to make her a pair of leather slippers with nubby rubber soles. They were perfectly fitted in her feet and gripped any surface with surety. On the second story of the exchange, she hoisted herself into a window ledge, just wide enough to perch on. Kaz had done his best to teach her, but he, she didn't quite have his way with breaking and entering, and it took her a few tries to finesse the lock. Finally, she heard a satisfying click, and the window swung open on a deserted office, its walls covered in maps marked with trade routes and chalkboards, listing share prices and names of ships. She ducked inside, refastened her, the latch, and picked her way past the empty desk with their neat stacks and orders of tallies. She crossed to a slender set of doors and stepped onto a balcony that overlooked the central courtyard of the exchange. Each of the shipping offices had one. From here, callers announced new voyages and arrivals of inventory, where hung the black flag that indicated that a ship had been lost at sea with all its cargo. The floor of the exchange would erupt into a flurry of trades. Runners would spread the world throughout the city, and the price of goods, futures, and shares in outgoing voyages would rise or fall. But tonight, all was silence. A wind came in off the harbor, bringing the smell of sea, ruffling the stray hairs that had escaped the braided coil at the nape of Inej's neck. Down in the square, she saw the sway of lamplight and heard the thump of Kaz's cane on the stones as he and his seconds made their way across the square. 
On the opposite side, she glimpsed another set of launchers heading toward them. The black tips had arrived. Inez raised her hood. She pulled herself onto the railing and leapt soundlessly into the neighboring balcony. And then next, tracing Kaz and the others around the square, staying close as she could. His dark coat rippled in the salt breeze, his limp more pronounced tonight, as it always was when the weather turned cold. She could hear Jesper keeping up a lively stream of conversation and Big Balger's low, rumbling chuckle. As she drew nearer to the other side of the square, Inez saw that the gales had chosen to bring Elzinger and Omen, exactly as she had predicted. Inez knew the strengths and weaknesses of every member of the Black Tips, not to mention Harley's pointers and Liddy's and Razor Girls, the Dime Lions, and every other gang working the streets of Ketterdam. It was her job to know that Giles trusted Elzinger because they'd come up through the ranks of the Black Tips together, and because Elzinger was built like a stack of boulders, nearly seven feet tall, dense with muscle, his wide, mashed and face jammed low on a neck thick as a pylon. She was suddenly glad Big Bulger was with Kaz. That Kaz had chosen Jesper to be one of his seconds was no surprise. Twitchy as Jesper was, with or without his revolvers, he was at his best in a fight, and she knew he'd do anything for Kaz. She'd been less sure when Kaz had insisted on Big Balger as well. Big Ball was a, bou- was a bouncer at the Crow Club, perfectly suited to tossing out drunks and wasters, but too heavy on his feet to be much use when it came to a real tussle. Still, at least he was tall enough to look Elzinger in the eye. Inez didn't want to think too much of Gil's other second. Omen made her too nervous. He wasn't physically intimidating as Elzinger. In fact, Omen was made like a scarecrow, not scrawny, as, but as if beneath his clothes, his body had been put together at wrong angles. Word was he'd once crushed a man's skull with his bare hands, wiped his palms clean on his shirt front, and kept right on drinking. Inez tried to quiet the unease rolling through her. She listened as Gales and Cad made a small talk in the square while their seconds padded of them down to make sure no one was carrying. Naughty, Jesper said as he removed a tiny knife from Elzinger's sleeve and tossed it across the square. Clear, declared Big Balger as he finished patting down Gilles and moved to the omen. Kaz and Gilles discussed the weather, the suspicion that Cooper Room was serving watered-down drinks now that the rent had been raised, dancing around the real reason they'd come here tonight. In theory, they would chat, make their apologies, agree to respect the boundaries of Fifth Harbor, and then head out to find a drink together. At least that's what Per Haskell had insisted. But what does Per Haskell know? Inez thought as she looked for the guards patrolling the roof above, trying to pick out their shapes in the dark. Haskell ran the dregs, but these days, he preferred to sit in the warmth of his room, drinking lukewarm lager, building model ships, and telling long stories of his exploits to anyone who would listen. He seemed to think ter- he seemed to think territory could be settled once as they once had been, with a short scuffle and a friendly handshake, but every one of Inez's senses told her that told her was not how this was going to play out. Her father would have said the shadows were about their own business tonight. Something bad was going to happen here. Cass stood with both gloved hands resting on the carved crow's head of his cane. He looked totally at ease, his nor- narrow face obscured by the brim of his hat. Most gang members in the barrel loved flash, gaudy waistcoats, watch fobs studded with false gems, trousers in every print and pattern imaginable. Cass was the exception, the picture of restraint, his dark vest and trousers simply cut and tailored along se- severe lines. At first, he thought it was a matter of taste, but she'd come to understand that it was a joke he played on the upstanding merchers. He enjoyed looking like one of them. I'm a businessman, he told her. No more, no less. You're a thief, Kaz. Isn't that what I just said? Now he looked like some of some kind of priest come to preach to a group of circus performers. A young priest, she thought, with another pang of unease. Kaz had called Giles old and washed up, but he certainly didn't seem that way tonight. The black tips lieutenant might have wrinkles creasing the corner of his eyes and burgoyne jewels beneath his sideburns, but he looked confident, experienced. Next to him, Kaz looked, well, seventeen. Isn't it fair, yeah? All we want is a bit more scrub, Gail said, tapping the mirrored buttons of his lime green waistcoat. It's not fair for you to call every spend happy tourist stepping off a pleasure boat at Fifth Harbor. Fifth Harbor is ours, Gail's Kaz replied. The dregs got uh, the dregs get first crack at pigeons who come looking for a, li- a little fun. Gail shook his head. You're a young one, Brecker, he said with an indulgent laugh. Maybe you don't understand how these things work. The harbors belong to the city, and we have much right to them as anyone. We've all got a living to make. Technically, that was true, but Fifth Harbor had been useless and all but abandoned by the city when Kaz had taken it over. He'd had it dredged and then built on the docks at the quay, and he'd had to mortgage the Crow Club to do it. Per Haskell had railed at him and called him a fool for the expense, and, and but eventually he'd, he'd relented. According to Kaz, the old man's exact, exact words had been, Take all that rope and hang yourself. But the endeavor had paid for itself in less than a year. Now Fifth Harbor offered berths to merchant ships, as well as boats from all over the world, carrying tourists and soldiers eager to see sights and sample the pleasures of Ketterdam. The Drakes at first tried all of them, steering them and their wallets into brothels, taverns, and gambling dens owned by the gang. Fifth Harbor had made the old man very rich and cemented the Drakes as real players in the barrel as a, in a way that not even the success of the Crow Club had. But with profit came unwanted attention. Gills and the 
Deals in the black tips had been making double for the drags all year, encroaching on Fifth Harbor, picking off pigeons that weren't rightfully theirs. Fifth Harbor, as ours, Kaz repeated, isn't, it isn't up for negotiation. You're cutting into our traffic from the docks, and you intercepted a shipment of Durda that should have docked two nights ago. Don't know how, what you're talking about. I know it comes easy, Gills, but you try but try not to play dumb with me. Gills took a step forward. Jesper and Big Ball grew tensed. Quit flexing, boy, Gills said. We all know the old man doesn't have a stomach for a real brawl. Kaz's laugh was dry as the rustle of dead leaves. But I'm the one at your table, Gills, and I'm not here for a taste. You want war? I'll make sure you eat your fill. And what if you're not around, Brecker? Everyone knows you're the spine of Haskell's operation. Snap it and the dregs collapse. Jesper snorted. Stomach, spine. What's next, Lean? Shut it. Omen snarled. The rules of Parley dictated that only the lieutenants could speak once negotiations had begun. Jesper mouthed sorry and elaborately pantomimed, locking his lips shut. I'm fairly sure you're threatening me, Gills, Kaz said, but I want to be certain before I decide what to do about it. Sure of yourself, aren't you, Brecker? Myself and nothing else. Gills burst out laughing and elbowed Omen. Listen to this cocky little piece of crap. Brecker, you don't own this, these streets. Kids like you are fleas. A new crop of you turns up every few years to annoy your betters until a big dog decides to scratch. And let me tell you, I'm about tired of the itch. He crossed his arms, pleasure rolling off him in smug waves. What if I told you there are two guards with city-issue rifles pointed at you and your boys right now? And as your stomach dropped. Was that what Cass had meant when, when he said Gills might have the guards in his pocket? Kaz glanced at the roof. Hiring city guards to do your killing? I say that's an expensive proposition for a gang like the Black Tips. I'm not sure I believe your coffers could support it. Inesh climbed onto the railing and launched herself from the safety of the balcony, heading for the roof. If they survived the night, she was going to kill Kaz. There were always two guards from Stadwatch posted on the roof of the exchange. A few Kruger from the Dregs and Black Tips had ensured they wouldn't interfere with, fear with Parley, a common enough transaction. But Gills was implying something very different. Had he really managed to bribe the city guards to pay play sniper for him? If so, the Dregs' odds of surviving this night had just dwindled to a knife's point. Like most of the buildings in Ketterdam, the exchange had sharply ga had a sharply gabbled roof to keep off heavy rain, so the guards patrolled the roof via a narrow walkway that overlooked the courtyard. And Edge ignored it. It was easier going, but would leave her too exposed. Instead, she scaled halfway up the slick roof tiles and started crawling, her body tilted at a precarious ankle, moving like a spider as she kept one eye on the guard's walkway and one ear on the conversation below. Maybe Gilles was bluffing, or maybe two guards were hunched over the railing right now with Kaz or Jesper or Big Bulger in their sights. Took some doing, Gilles admitted. We're a small operation right now, and city's guards don't come cheap, but it'll be worth it for the prize. That being me, that being you. I'm flattered. The dregs won't last a week without you. I give them a month on sheer momentum. The thought rattled noisily around in Anesha's head. If Kaz was gone, would I stay or would I skip out on my debt? Take my chances with Perhaskel's enforcers? If she didn't move faster, she might w well fa find out. Smug little slum rat, Gills laughed. I can't wait to wipe that look off your face. So do it, Kaz said. Anesha still looked down. His voice had changed, uh, all human gone. Should I have them put a bullet in your good leg, Brecker? Where are the guards, Inej thought, picking up her pace. She raced across the steep pitch of the gable. The exchange stretched nearly the, the length of the city block. There was too much territory to cover. Stop talking, Gilles. Tell them to shoot. Kaz, said Jesper nervously. Go on, find your balls and give the order. What game was Kaz playing? Had he expected this? Had he just assumed Inej would find her way to the guards in time? She glanced down again. Gilles radiated anticipation. He, lo he took a deep breath, puffing on his chest. Inej stepped f Inej's steps faltered and she had to fight not to go sliding straight off the edge of the roof. He's going to do it. I'm going to watch Kaz die. Fire, Gilles shouted. A gunshot split the air. Big Bulger let loose a cry and crumpled into the ground. Dang it, shouted Jesper, dropping to one knee, beside Bulger and pressing his hand to the bullet wound as the big man moaned. You worthless podge, he yelled at Gilles. You violated neutral territory. Nothing to say you didn't shoot first, Gilles replied. And who's going to know? None of you are walking out of here. Gil's voice sounded too high. He was trying to maintain his composure, but Inej could hear the panic pulsing against his words. But the startled wing beat of a frightened bird. Why? Moments before, he'd been all bluster. That was when Inej saw Kaz still hadn't moved. He didn't look well, Gil's. I'm just fine, he said, but he wasn't. He looked pale and shaky. His eyes were darting right and left as searching the shadowed walkway of the roof. Are you? Kaz asked. Conversationally, things aren't going quite as planned, are they? Kaz, Jesper said. Bulger's bleeding bad. Good, said Kaz. Kaz, he needs a medic. Kaz spared the wounded man at the barest glance. What he needs is to stop his belly aching and be glad I didn't have the holes taken down with a headshot, even from above, and I saw Gilles flinch. That's the guard's name, isn't it? Kaz said. William Holst and Bert Van Dow, the two city guards on duty tonight, the ones you emptied the black tips coffers to bribe? Gilles said nothing. William Holst, Kaz said loudly, his voice floating up to the roof, likes to gamble almost as much as Jesper does, so your money held a lot of appeal, but Holst had much bigger problems. Let's call them urges. I won't go into detail. A secret's not like a coin. It doesn't keep its value in the spending. 
you'll just have to trust me when I say this one would turn even your stomach. Isn't that right, host? The response was another gunshot. It struck the cobblestones near Gil's feet. Gil's released a shock bleed and sprang back. This time, Inej had a better chance to track the origin of the gunfire. The shot had come from somewhere near the west side of the building. If Hulse was there, that meant the other guard, Bert Van Dahl, would be on the east side. Had Cass managed to neutralize them too, or was he counting on her? She sped over the gables. Just shoot him, Hulse. Gales bellowed, desperation sawing falling at his voice. Shoot him in the head. Cass snorted in disgust. Do you really think a secret would die with me? Go on, Holst, he called. Put a bullet in my skull. There will be messengers sprinting to your wife and your watch, Captain Zor, before I hit the ground. No shot came. How, Gil said bitterly. How did you know who would be on duty tonight? I had to bathe through the grills to get that roaster. You wouldn't have outbid me. Let's say my currency carries more sway. Money is money. I trade information, Gills. The things that men do when they think no one is looking. Shame holds more value than coin ever can. He was grandstanding, and Nesh saw that, buying her time as she leapt over the slate's shingles. Are you worrying about the second guard? Good old Bert Van Dahl. Kaz asked, maybe he's up there right now, wondering what he should do. Shoot me? Shoot host? Or maybe I got him too, and he's getting ready to blow a hole in your chest, Gills. He leaned in as if he and Gills were sharing a great secret. Why not give Van Dahl the order to find out? Gilles opened and closed his mouth like a carp, then bellowed, Van Dahl! Just as Van Dahl parted his lips to answer, Nesh slipped up behind him and placed a blade to his throat. She'd barely had time to pick out his shadow and then slide down the roof tiles. Saints, Kaz liked to cut it close. Shh, she whispered in Van Dahl's ear. She gave him a tiny jab in the side so he could feel the point of her second dagger pressed against his kidney. Please, he moaned. I, I like it when men beg, she said, but this isn't the time for it. Below, she could see Gilles' chest rising and falling with panic breath. Van Dahl, he shouted. There was rage on his face when he... Re- when he turned back to Kaz. Always one step ahead, aren't you? Gills, when it comes to you, I- I'd say I have a running start. But Gills just smiled, a tiny smile, tight and satisfied, a victor smile, and Nez realized with fresh fear. The race isn't over yet. Gills reached into his jacket and pulled out a heavy black pistol. Finally, Kaz said, the big reveal. Now Jesper can stop keening over Balger like a wet-eyed woman. Jesper stared at the gun with stunned, furious eyes. Balger searched him. He, oh, big ball, you idiot, he groaned. And Nesh couldn't believe what she was seeing. The guard in her arms released a tiny squeak. In her anger and surprise, she'd accidentally tightened her grip. Relax, she said, easing her hold. But, all saints, she wanted to put that knife through something. Big Bulger had been the one to pack down Gilles. There was no way he could have missed the pistol. He'd betrayed them. Was that why Kaz had insisted on bringing Big Bulger here tonight, so he'd have a public confirmation that Bulger had gone over the black tips? It was certainly why he'd let Holst put a bullet in Bulger's gut. But so what? Now everyone knew Big Ball was traitor. Kaz still had a gun pointed at his chest. Gil smirked. Kaz Brecker, the great escape artist. How are you going to wriggle your way out of this one? Going out the same way I came in. Kaz ignored the pistol, turning his attention to the big man laying on the ground. Do you know what your problem is, Bulger? He jabbed the wound in Big Ball's stomach with the tip of his cane. That wasn't a rhetorical pr- question. You know what your biggest problem is? Big Bulger mewled. No, give me a guess, Kaz hissed. Big Ball said nothing, just released another trembling whimper. All right, I'll tell you. You're lazy. I know it. Everyone knows it. So I had to ask myself why the laziest bouncers was getting up early twice a week to walk two extra miles to chills fry for breakfast, especially when the eggs are much better at Cooper Room. Big Ball becomes an early riser. The black tips start throwing their weight around Fifth Harbor and then intercept their biggest shipment of Durba. It wasn't a, a tough connection to make. He sighed and said to Gilles, this is what happens when stupid people start making big plans, yeah? Doesn't matter much now, does it? Replied Gilles. This gets ugly. I'm shooting from close range. Maybe your guards get me or my guys, but no way you're going to dodge this bullet. Cass stepped into the barrel of the gun so that it was pressed directly against his chest. No way at all, Gilles. You think I won't do it? Oh, I think you'll do it gladly, with a strong in your black heart. But you won't. Not tonight. Gilles' finger twitched on the trigger. Cass, Jesper said, this whole shoot me thing is starting to concern me. Omen doesn't bother to object to Jesper mouthing off this time. One man was down. Neutral territory had been violated. The sharp tang of gunpowder already hung in the air, and along with a question, unspoken in the quiet, as if the reaper himself awaited the answer. How much blood will be shed tonight? In the distance, a siren wailed. Nineteen burst rat, Kaz said. Gills had been shifting slightly from foot to foot. Now he went very still. That's your girl's address, isn't it, Gills? Gills swallowed. Don't have a girl. Oh, yes, you do, Coon Kaz. She's pretty, too. Well, pretty enough for a fink like you. Seems sweet. You love her, don't you? Even from the rooftop, Inej could see the sheen of sweat on Gil's waxen face. Of course you do. No one that fine should ever have a look twice at barrel scum like you. But she's different. She finds charming. Sure sign of madness, if you ask me. But love is strange that way. Does she like to rest her pretty head on your shoulder? Listen to you talk about your day? Gil looked at Kaz, as if he was finally seeing him for the first time. The boy he'd been talking to had been cocky, reckless, easily amused, but not frightening, not really. Now the monster was here, dead-eyed and unafraid. Kaz Brecker was gone, and Dirty Hands had come to see the rough work done. She lives at 19 Bristrat, said Kaz in his gravelly rasp. 
three floors up, German Ina's in the window boxes. There are two dregs waiting outside her door right now, and if I don't walk out of here whole and feeling righteous, they will set that place alight from floor to rooftop. It will go up in seconds, burning from both ends, with poor Elise trapped in the middle. Her blonde hair will catch hers, like a wick of a candle. You're bluffing, said Beals, but his pistol hand was trembling. Kaz lifted his head and inhaled deeply. Getting late now, you heard the siren. I smell the harbor on the wind, sea, sea salt, and maybe, is that smoke I smell too? There's pleasure in his voice. Oh, Saints Kaz, and Edge saw it miserably. What have you done now? Again, Gil's finger twitched on the trigger, and an edge tensed. I know, Gil's, I know, Kaz said sympathetically. All that planning and scheming and bribing for nothing, that's what you're thinking right now. How bad it would feel to walk home knowing that you've lost, how angry your boss is going to be when you show up empty-handed, and that much poorer for it. How satisfying it would be to put a bullet in my heart. You can do it. Pull the trigger. We can all go down together. They can take our bodies out to the Reaper's Barge for burning, like all the paupers go. Or you can take the blow to your pride, go back to Burstrat, lay your head in your girl's lap, fall asleep still breathing, and dream of revenge. It's up to you, Gills. Do we go? Ho do we get to go home tonight? Gills searched Kaz's gaze, and whatever he saw there made his shoulders sag. Inej was surprised to feel a pang of pity for him. He'd walked into this place, Beoda, and Bravado, a survivor, a champion of the bear, he'd leave as another victim of Kaz Wrecker. You'll get what's coming for you someday, Wrecker. I will, said Kaz, and if there's any justice in the world, and we all know how likely that is. Gills let his arm drop. His pistol hung uselessly by his side. Kaz stepped back, crushed in the front of the shirt where the gun barrel had rested. Go tell your general to keep the black tips out of Fifth Harbor, and that we expect him to make amends for the shipment of journal we lost, plus 5% for drawing steel on neutral ground, and 5% more for being such a spectacular bunch of butts. Then Kaz's cane swung in a sudden sharp arc. Gills screamed at his wrist bones shattered. The gun clattered to the paving stones. S I stood down, cried Gills, cradling his hand. His hand. I stood down. You draw on me again, I'll break both your wrists, and you'll have to hire somebody to help you take a pee. Kaz chipped the brim of his hat up with the head of his cane, or maybe you can get a lovely Elise to do it for you. Kaz crashed down beside Bolger. The big man whimpered. Look at me, Bolger. Assuming you don't bleed to death tonight, you have until sunset tomorrow to get out of Ketterdam. I hear you're anywhere near the city limits, and they'll find you stuffed at, in a keg at Hill's Fry. Then he looked at Gules. You help Bolger, or I find you, or I find out he's running with the black tips. Don't think I won't come after you. Please, Kaz, moaned Bolger. You had a home, and you put a wrecking ball through the front door, Bolger. Don't look for, for any sympathy from me. He rose and checked his pocket watch. I didn't expect a, this to go on so long. I'd best be on my way, or poor Elise will be getting a trifle warm. Gilles shook his head. There's something wrong with you, Brecker. I don't know what you are, but you're not made right. Kaz cocked his head to one side. You're from the suburbs, aren't you, Gilles? Came to the city to try out your luck? He smoothed his label with one gloved hand. Well, I'm the kind of bastard they only manufacture in the barrel. Despite the load gun at the black tip's feet, Cass turned his back on them and limped across the cobblestones toward the eastern arc. Jesper squatted down next to Bolger and gave him a gentle pat on the cheek. Idiot, he said sadly, and followed Kaz out of the exchange. From the roof, and Edge continued to watch as Omen picked up and holstered Gil's gun, and, and the black tips said a few quiet words to each other. Don't leave, Big Bulger begged. Don't leave me. He tried to cling to the cuff of Gil's trousers. Gil shook him off. They left him curled on his side, leaking blood onto the cobblestones. And Edge plucked Van Dow's rifle from his hands before she released him. Go home, she told the guard. He cast a single terrified glance over his shoulder and sprinted off down the walkway. Far below, Big Bull started trying to drag himself across the floor of the exchange. He might be stupid enough to cross Kaz Brecker, but he'd survive this long in the barrel, and, it, and that took Will. He might make it. Help him, a voice inside, inside her said. Until a few moments ago, he'd been her brother in arms. It seemed wrong to leave him alone. She could go to him, offer to put him out of his misery quickly, hold his hand as he passed. She could fetch a medic to save him. Instead, she spoke a quick prayer in the language of her saints and began to steep climb down the outer wall. Inez pitied the boy who might die alone with no one to comfort him in his last hours or might live and spend the, his life in an exile. But the night's work wasn't over yet and the wraith didn't have time for traitors.